Okay, so here we go. Uh, we'll call this part three, but it's really the roundworm slideshow, phylum nematoda. There's a lot here. In platyhelminthes, I called them flatty helminthes for a reason, because they are so primitive as organisms that they don't even have a hollow internal body cavity, right? And there's no space for internal organ systems. Now, true to form, Mother Nature improves upon design. Uh, that's just natural selection and evolution, folks. Uh, moving on with the dose of mutation, of course. And we get to something called phylum nematoda. Now, our nematodes are what we call our, our roundworms. They're not as advanced as our earthworm, but they are impressive nonetheless because they're the first time that we see something with a, a body cavity to make room for organ systems and much more space for tissues. Now, if you look at the videos, we've met the planarian. Uh, you should have gone to class Cystoda, gone to the animation of the tapeworm life cycle. By now, you should be really grossed out, but you know that combinatrin, that little yellow goop, is a great way to poison them. The pork tapeworm, you won't be eating your pork medium rare anytime soon. Blood fluke life cycle, so our, our snail and human sort of life cycle, which is really horrible. Uh, trichinosis, uh, consuming on pork and getting those horrible cysts in your body um, if they make their way to your brain you've got a serious life-threatening disorder we'll examine the hookworms now so these last few videos uh, from these last three here will be really important to look at because these will be our phylum nematoda examples so that's sort of the defining line in the videos that I've shown you and of course there's what to read in specific pages so we'll get reflection going and uh, sort of fill in our course notes and pop along and check out these life cycles as need be. Twenty-seven two the roundworms is all about the hollow space that I'm going to trace right here. It's it's kind of floppy, like it's not a it's, Mother Nature didn't do such a wonderful job on her first design, but this hollow space right there between the mesoderm and the endoderm, which I'm marking like this, is known as the pseudocelum, more or less. Let's see if I can highlight that. Come here, you. No, it's not going to let me, so I'll just go with hot pink. There we go. The pseudocelum is that hollow region right there. So it's important to label these things. You should know your regions. There's your ectoderm, which I just defined with ecto. And there's your mesoderm, which I like to refer, refer to as the muscular layer. But there's a bit more in it. You'll find some body systems in it. And now we've got the coelom. In this case, it's the first one, and it's flimsy, so we say it's it's a pseudocelum. It's not quite the fluid-filled wonder chamber that it'll become in more advanced organisms, but it is one. And our digestive tract, we don't want to leave out, that is our endoderm. It was color highlighted, but you know me, I had to do the full meal deal. So roundworms are pretty well parasitic. They'll go after just about anything you can find. I remember down in Victoria, they closed an entire, an entire field just outside the airport because of an invasion of uh, roundworms. And the soil was so contaminated that they had to leave it fallow for the better part of 10 years. By fallow, it means you just don't grow anything on it. You make sure that nothing grows on it so the parasite essentially just starves to death. So they are free living. You'll find them in the soil, uh, salt tolerant, water varieties. You can find them pretty well everywhere. And these things are, are very nasty. They're very parasitic. And um, as soon as I see roundworms, I think of these, this horrible uh, genus known as Ascaris, which if you ingest its oral fecal, just like we've seen with many of these life cycles, it, it will develop in, in the intestines and it um, one of the videos will definitely show you how that went. One of the suggested ones that I said take a look at. 
they're unsegmented. So by that we mean it's not like an earthworm where you see these nice fine defined segments, right? And then on the earthworm you see that sort of region like that. You don't see that with these guys. So I'll just erase it. They're pretty plain and really it's all about bringing in food here and passing it out through here. They're all about reproduction and they're all about parasitizing. In fact, when we do the Ascaris dissection and you open up one of these, you will see mostly reproductive tissue and you can see just how strongly they're focused on it. Going on to this slide, they talk about the pseudocelum, a false coelom. It's just not as well developed as we see in later organisms. It does derive in the mesoderm. That's a very important, important point. It's a cavity, has origins in the mesoderm, so we call it a pseudocelum. Okay. Now, pseudo is a Latin word for false. It doesn't mean it's not one. It just means it's it's pretty fake compared to the more impressive ones we see, see later. We saw the term pseudo when we were talking about pseudopods, the false feet of amoeba. That term pseudo comes up again and again. Uh, about two slides ago we showed that they had two openings, really a mouth and an anus. right? So it, wherever you see a mouth there's usually a pharynx. These little guys being parasites will take advantage of living inside their host because they're basically, well, there's food, food all around and they can have what they want. Your digestive juices are breaking down the food. It's like a giant food milkshake for these guys. It's a tremendous opportunity for them, which is why whenever nature provides an opportunity, a niche, some animals will move into that niche and try to exploit it. So what is their digestive system? You're looking at a hookworm here, folks. So because they're parasites, that's the th sort of the first thing we point out. Hookworms, a lot of these worms can be free living, but they would prefer to parasitize you. And these hookworms have these mouth parts and they'll literally slide inside of the body. Now if I pop out from reflection for just a sec, um, there's a video uh, right here that I want you to click on. Okay, so the beauty of this right now, you can check out this hookworm because th once this worm gets inside the body, it's pretty nasty. Um, I want to show you an animation of that, but I would advise that you watch that video. Again, this is some pretty heavy stuff. And this is a this is the hookworm one that I wanted to display. Um, Soil transmitted. The neat thing about this is I can, I can sort of hurry up this little flash animated life cycle. So there's a majority of worms here. What they focus on here is they say it's primarily a, an oral fecal life cycle. Low income communities, not great sanitation. I'll just sort of narrate this as it goes along. They don't have as obviously as much sanitation in these villages as we do. It's not central sanitation. So that might look horrible, but that's just a fact of life. Somebody goes to the bathroom. They were infected and they've contaminated the environment with worm eggs, which is why you can see that our sanitation system that we use is so important. It, it helps to keep parasites um, under control. Not We're not contaminating our water and we have uh, central sanitation to make sure that we're taking care of these issues. That's why we put things into our water like chlorine and fluoride. Now if in the feces you've you've basically here's the fecal part of the life cycle with hookworms um, the hookworms are now in free living and in the soil and they're just more or less waiting for a host right there can be different varieties of worms seeing the development of a round worm. This isn't as important. I just want you to see that the worms developed in there, that little container. Takes a little while. Hookworms, whipworms, they're both pretty nasty. They want to get 
the one these particular varieties want to uh, burrow into the pads of animals or into the skin of humans. So we'll give them a second hatch here. Seven to eight days, basically a week. You get the idea. So you're sitting having nice lunch and those larvae, you can't really see them, pretty small. The, the environment is contaminated. So, I mean, it, one way to get them in the body is to consume them. That That's more or less easy for them contaminated soil or and it, it comes up at the end of the video in the free living form they would literally try to burrow and get underneath the skin and one of those videos on the hookworm talks about a pretty nasty case where uh, a lady got one of these from uh, monsters inside me now once the hookworm is inside the body it well that's that's primarily where it wants to be. It will uh, breed, multiply, uh, release uh, it. Well, by breeding, it'll it'll fertilize. It'll try to release its eggs. It'll try to get to the. Um, in, it'll try to get to the digestive organs. Any place it can get to in your digestive system, where it can start to release its eggs. So here. So let's. There we go. And it's that it, these little mouth parts that it uses to uh, do its job. It's it's able capable of secreting an enzyme that can dissolve tissues so that it can migrate through your tissues. So it has you can see why it's called a hookworm, and because of it, the strong enzymes it can produce, it can break down tough tissues and work its way further inside you. Respiration, circulation, and excretion. This diagram is just pointing out that it's all about diffusion. A lot of these critters don't need these three systems because they're just so thin. They're thin. And they have a high surface area. Let's see here if I can scroll down. They have a really high surface area to volume ratio. So what that means is that they have a tremendous amount of, think of it as outside skin, surface area, lots and lots and lots. And there's so much, there's so much area for the exchange of carbon dioxide and CO2 and the release of waste products that there, there's so much, there's a tremendous opportunity for things to get out. And that's what they're showing here. The net flow is simple. CO2 will flow in, or sorry, um, oxygen will flow in very easily. And CO2 particles, on the other hand, if we drew a buildup of CO2, those CO2 particles that are building up, if they're more concentrated on the inside, will just flow right on out. So it's what we'd say is a concentration gradient. That's what diffusion is all about. More concentrated inside, out it goes. So let's, well, if we said this is outside compared to the inside, that's because they're so darn thin. So what you need to know is that the three body systems you won't see in these guys, you won't really see respiratory, circulatory, or excretory. They are taken care of by how flat these worms are. Now we can't do that. We have too much of an internal volume compared to our, our surface area. So we can't breathe through our skin. Right? There is some diffusion. It is not enough to keep up with our demands. We have very high metabolisms and lots going on inside our bodies. We, we couldn't depend on diffusion like these guys. So how do they move? Locomotory. Well, it's not like they have a skeleton, but they do have 
uh, that coelom, that hollow space, and they can attach their mesoderm to it, so they can they can pull and push, and they're squeezing on that 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 against that pseudo coelom, and it gives them something to kind of hold on to. As we look at earthworms, it's very similar. They've got their muscles attached to the the inside of their body, and it's a it's a fluid filled chamber. So what it really gives you is it's like an internal skeleton. Think of it as like a, a, a sort of a large sort of watery like region, uh, like a water bone. And that is the thing that the muscles can pull and push and pull on. So we say in these conditions, because this is a fluid filled chamber and it runs all down the body and it's fairly thick, that it's something that the muscles can press against and we call it a hydrostatic skeleton. When you look at roundworms move, they kind of squirm and wiggle. So they kind of move in a snake-like fashion. And the soil-dwelling ones, well, they, they thrash around and, and try to burrow their way into the soil. Right? So in the water, it's just much more of a snake-like motion. But on the ground, you see them just flailing. Sexual reproduction, no surprise there. But in this case, we will make a note that we have separate sexes. So when we look at our roundworms, this is phylum nematoda. Unlike platyhelminthes, phylum nematoda, our roundworms have separate sexes. Males, females, separate. When we open up a scarus, you'll see that. So they can have life cycles that are still pretty complicated with intermediate hosts. Um, obviously, you know that because we're in the reproduction section, this is where it gets gooey and interesting. So human ascarid reproduction. So a diagram like this presents itself, and you say, well, really, where do, we, where do you even start? You start with the ascaris worm. And the Ascaris worm itself, we've got the separate male and female spe uh, uh, versions of the worm, right? Different sexes. Now, the Ascaris worm is the adult variety. So, what's going to happen? Well, it's going to release eggs that are going to get out into the feces. So, let's let's sort of begin at the there where they're successful. So, the Ascaris worm will live in intestinal tissue like this. And it can get quite long. In fact, uh, one of the videos that you'll read talks about it as being they can get up to 12 centimeters long. And you really don't want them to bust out of this region. You don't want them in the rest of the body. If they release their eggs, and they will if they infect you, those will get into the grass and onto the ground. And what we've got is a problem because if the egg is fertilized, we've got a viable egg, fertilized egg, let's call it for what it is, a zygote. Um, Ascaris will have relations in your intestine, by the way, so fertilized eggs are pretty well a given. The zygote will go on and divide, so we'll follow this around. It's dividing, getting bigger, and you'll get, you basically get a fertilized egg in, contaminated in the soil. So here's your worm inside wiggling away and the human comes into contact with contaminated some well basically contaminated soil. You ingest an Ascaris worm again and the Ascaris worm gets into the body there it is it's being consumed travels down through the stomach into the intestines and voila we are back into the digestive system. So again it's an oral fecal life cycle. You just basically ingest ingest the egg. Um, pop out for one sec. Turn that off. So on the website there's an Ascaris roundworm infection there. You need to click on that and watch that video. Uh, these videos are really long, so I'm not previewing them in the browser, but go watch the Ascaris roundworm infection now.
Okay, and that'll pretty well finalize what I wanted you to know there. When you're back, and I'm going to show this one next, we'll look at filaria, which is elephantiasis, which um, there was a uh, movie made about this called The Elephant Man. I remember Cher was in it. I was a kid. I think it came out in about the mid, sort of lower mid 80s. And this, this one will be next. Come back in just a moment, and I'm going to hook up and get ready to go and talk about elephantiasis. This uh, nematode, which is a tiny little worm, but it's just an absolute nightmare. Okay, so looking at those little roundworms just before I move on to elephantiasis, um, these Ascaris worms are pretty big. Uh, these little worms, they'll, they'll form these little cysts sometimes. If you consume them, they can form, you can come into contact with contaminated feces. If you eat the meat of an animal that's got roundworm cysts in it, then you can become infected. Same thing as if you eat infected pork and you get a tapeworm. Except this time the worm is, well, as bad or even nastier. These scared worms, you're seeing a whole bowl of them here. Um, in some developing nations, they remove these from the, um, basically from the anuses of uh, villagers just to get them out. Because you can get, these things will form blockages which can be life-threatening for the host. Now, before going to trichinosis, Ascaris worms. Actually, I think I can just do it straight in my browser. An Ascaris blockage can be a real nightmare. Common a trend, which you see right here, will kill them dead, right? Same thing as tapeworms. Ascaris lumbricoids. There we go. Just go to images for a second. Doesn't take very long. Okay, so if left unchecked, these things can get into the into the bowels and they're just reproducing like crazy and they're releasing their fertilized eggs as well, but they can also develop inside. So these have to be removed. They're just a, a devastating uh, parasite, this one coming out of an animal. And it really, what we're talking about is just this worm right here, this little pseudocelomate worm. And there's the Center for Disease Control picture that you just saw. They will form these, they can form these little cysts, um, sort of like tough little, th tough little, uh, uh, almost look like little seeds, don't they? But they'll release, they'll also release their, let's see if I can get it zoomed in, they'll also release their uh, fertilized egg in a tough little container like that. So it's pretty resistant. Once it gets into the soil, it's just waiting for a host to come along. Now, how would you really consume it? Well, you could consume, uh, you could consume plant material. Um, you could consume an animal, right? That has become, become contaminated with these two cysts in the tissue. I think you get the idea. Okay. Now we'll talk about um, something you might have heard your parents or your grandparents talk about, a disease called trichinosis, where if you consume uncooked pork, you can get a little worm called uh, from the genus Trichinella that can make its way out of your digestive system. You've got to remember, your digestive system is about one heartbeat away from your circulatory system. If this little worm makes it into your circulatory system, it's on the superhighway to get around your body. And it will insist in tissues that it finds. This one can insist. Um, this one can insist in your muscle tissue, and if it gets into your brain, it can insist there and cause extreme pain. Okay, so uh, we'll come back to elephantiasis. I'm sorry I jumped around a little bit, but I I'm going to hold to this order. Trichinosis, uncooked pork. You kind of get the idea. So what have we got for trichinosis? So I've got a little animated life cycle for you. Trichinella. So the trichinella worm, I'll hold the animation here, I want to show you this first. The trichinella worm can be 
encapsulated in the muscle tissue. So if you think about it, something like bears where they eat carrion all the time, they're much more prone to picking up this worm. So if you've ever had bear meat, it the only thing you can really turn it into is sausage and you have to cook it like crazy to kill these little worms because it can be encapsulated in muscle tissue it's kind of lying dormant. And trichinella um, tends to affect pork because when you look at pigs, they're in contact with feces quite a bit. So eat holes in the muscle and build little houses called cysts and yeah, you'll get, it would be extremely painful. So that's the microslide of what it would look like encapsulated in muscle tissue. So you wouldn't want to consume that or you've just invited it into your body. Here it is encapsulated in the muscle tissue here. And um, it's not just going to stay there, but the pain of it burrowing in, you can imagine. And if it got into nervous tissue, drive you mad. And the consumption of uncooked pork or uh, these characters here if they consume if they consume an animal like think about it if a bear or a lynx or a bobcat comes along and consumes the flesh of another animal that has trichinella in it then they've just brought it into their body systems too so it, pretty nasty little life cycle um, it largely you can see it's it's transmitted by consuming the flesh of another infected animal this is why this particular variety loves to get into the muscle tissue because it wants to be eaten right so little note here where they say juveniles are digested from muscle they penetrate into the tissues of the small intestine where they grow into sexual maturity and that's the idea that's where they want to be to more or less sort of finish their life cycle and once they're once they're there you're looking at the infective stage so they really just at this point is just showing that they want to be eaten pretty gross i know so here's the thing cook your meat and your pork you don't want that to be medium rare so back here um, notice the scale this is 50 micrometers in diameter, so those worms are pretty small when they're encysted. And the dark purple is the muscle tissue. So there's your juveniles. There they are. They're ready to go. The bloodstream is their superhighway. They just want to get in. They just want to get eaten so they can get there. And there you go. The only way to really complete the life cycle is for them to be consumed. Which I always think about this when I eat pork and you see a little bit of pink in the middle and you're like, oh boy, did I just, you know, could I have gotten a, a cyst? Could I have gotten this thing? Right here. Because there's a parasitic worm just waiting to use you. We think we're at the top of the food chain and then I look at this sometimes and I wonder who's using who. The answer is everybody. Okay. Now, my apologies, I, I thought I was covering this before my before trichinosis and the trichinella little worm. What you're looking at here are filarial worms. Now, um, the disease is known uh, by a couple of names. Uh, let's that's the first one. The second name, because of the shape of the tissues, there we go, elephantiasis. Oh, push that off. There we go. You get this elephant like flesh. That's what they're naming it after, sort of the large limbs of the elephant. And these what happens is these little worms, once they get inside your body, get into little pipes of your lymphatic system. They're, they kind of run in parallel to your veins and your arteries and your lymphatic system is responsible for draining the tissue out of your fluids. If you've ever felt bloated, um, if you get a buildup of fluid in a region, it's your lymphatic system that tends to drain that, that lymph fluid. Well, little worms can get in those pipes of the lymphatic system and they could start to create 
blockages like this. And once they do, if once they kind of get together in clumps, and once they block the lymphatic tissue pretty well like this, there's very little flow of the lymph fluid, or it stops pretty well entirely. Um, you can actually ooze lymphatic, lymphatic cyst fluid out of your pores if it's too blocked. So how did this little devil get into our systems? Is this oral fecal? No. It got transmitted by mosquitoes. And that nasty little critter is basically injecting the worm, if this is the proboscis of the mosquito, it injects the worm into the skin, into the dermal layer. It gets it right down into the capillaries of the blood. And that worm just found a way to get in. Okay, so these little devils will make it in. Now, in the, the pictures that you're seeing here, these are the blocked tissues. So these tissues down here, let's choose a different color, these tissues are not draining. So getting bitten by a mosquito, there's worse things, well, I shouldn't say worse, there's co-equivalently worse things than just malaria out there. You can get these little tiny roundworms that get injected into your lymphatic system that can make it so that your tissues won't drain and you can get these horrendous buildup. Now that's obviously terrible. Uh, the scrotal sac in males can get extremely distended uh, if it doesn't drain so you can imagine just how horrible this disease can be for all involved. So pop out for just one sec because I have an animation to show you. Right here, this video on elephantiasis, you need to click now and watch because that is all about what I was just talking about. It takes a little while, but here's the lymphatic filariasis. I think I got the spelling right on that, life cycle. Here it comes. I'll do a little narrating here because I don't think we have any sound. So Wisheria bancrofti is the parasitic roundworm uh, that causes this. So here we go. So here's our unsuspecting human being bitten by the mosquito. So if you didn't have mosquito netting on or repellent, then unfortunately, if you get bitten by this mosquito, what can happen is the worm is using the mosquito as, an, as a host as well. And the, the worm gets into the site of infection and it's just gotten into the superhighway. They'll introduce the lymphatic system here. It runs in parallel to your nervous system and it's supposed to drain that fluid or that lymph, right, which is sort of like a clear yellow fluid. And it takes a, several days for the, these worms to sort of mature, and then they'll begin to do what these worms want to do, which is enter the reproductive life cycle. This is very specific on the timing. They basically mate in the lymphatic vessels, which is really gross, but, you know, it's fact. Now, the little immature larvae that are produced as a result of their mating, they're going from the lymphatic system, and lymphatic system is in parallel to the bloodstream, so they can get there too. Because they need to get back to the bloodstream, because they need the mosquito to drink them back up so they can go off and complete their life cycle again someplace else. So elephantiasis uses a mosquito and it uses um, a human to finish its life cycle. So here you go. You can see that the little critters are going to go down and live in the mosquito and they, they literally bore right into the mosquito's flesh and they're headed for the uh, essentially the uh, muscles and they'll stay they'll stay near the salivary glands and near the gut lining so they're using their host this is a lot of information but it's kind of neat so we'll let it play out what you really need to know is that the mosquito transmits it to the human and the human is um well transmits it back to the mosquito think of it that way so now they're infective here, 
and they make their way to the salivary glands and the mosquito conveniently pokes it back into the human. There we go. Back in the lymphatic system we go and this goes round and round. Pretty nasty little critter. Okay. So that'll bring us up to the end where they, they generally what they talk about are, are the diseases. Um, we've seen uh, uh, elephantiasis here. We go back, we were looking at trichinosis. And it's interesting they left this to last. Um, I'd already, oops, I guess I should reflect that, shouldn't I? Let's back up. Here's our diseases again. Uh, uh, trichinosis caused by eating uncooked pork. There's a roundworm infection for you. Phalaricis or elephantiasis, the blockage of the, uh, of basically of lymph nodes by these little worms, and they won't let the tissues drain. And Ascaris lumbricoides, you can see how that can fill up an intestine pretty badly. And that's life-threatening for the host because if you can't have a bowel movement because these things are in the way, you've got a major problem. And they have to be, they literally have to remove them. Um, the Ascaris life cycle, consuming that egg, egg travels to the small intestine, develops into larva, so classic oral fecal life cycle. Now Ascaris itself, interestingly enough, um, because it gets into your digestive system, it, it can also enter the blood vessels and it can get to the lungs. So that does make the potential of coughing up the larva as well. They, if, if you cough them up at the back of your throat, sometimes if you've ever coughed up something nasty from your lungs, you'll swallow it again because you can get it right back down into your intestines. So they can make it to the lungs and then you cough them and they go right back down into the intestine. This is a lot more detail than I would expect you to know in the Ascaris life cycle. What I would want you to know, uh, it wouldn't the lung portion wouldn't be so important. It's just that the life cycle will complete in the gut and it will be released from the body. That little trip to the lungs is something. And this picture is the removal of all the scared worms that these medical practitioners did out of the goodness of their heart to remove from the village. So you could see why sanitation is so important, why water has to be treated, why people can't go to the bathroom near a water source because we can't have these infected eggs and these little worms uh, being transmitted through contaminated waste, right? You can't really say, here's the vaccine for this. That's, that's not sufficient. Similarly, you have to consider the effect of, of heartworm. Um, heartworm is another little roundworm. And this one, all I would expect you to know with heartworms is that the mosquito sucks the blood of say an infected animal like your dog and when it transmits the worms into the dog those worms can also take up residence in the heart so there's a lot of information here when you look at your slide but just understand this this one is just sort of a, a mosquito and a blood sort of relationship and if the dog gets these Right? And if they're not treated for heartworms, if they're not given proper medication to get rid of these worms, um, the heartworms will take up residency and the heart can't take that kind of pressure. It's obviously fatal. We've already sort of seen the hookworms previously. These are the ones that burrow into your skin, the sharp little plates. Uh, we've seen this animation. With uh, where the the boy went to the bathroom in the uh, in the village, they're called the hookworms because of the sharp little plates on their mouths. But they want to basically get into your bloodstream, and they want to hang around your intestines. It's a great place to get a lunch. And this slide shows them pretty accurately, attached to the. Uh, well, once they get, they can get into the lungs. They can get in the intestines. Um, they're sucking blood. These little hookworms, anemia, poor growth, right? And this is just 
for show, stupid little video or a slide here on Gigantus wormius. Just to say that this, this, these small little roundworms are so parasitic, they don't seem like a big deal, but they are a big problem. So that looks like a giant Ascaris to me. Okay. Make sure that you have a chance. If you're traveling on the road, uh, check out these videos. If I presented them in class, that's great. Check them out again. The big thing I want you to know about these worms is that phylum, nem phylum platyhelminthes, which we first looked at, had no coelom, right? So we had some nasty varieties in there. Our um, trematodes, our class trematoda, and our our class uh, cestoda, like our tapeworms, liver flukes, tapeworms, you get it. They really were sort of like the first stage in the migration towards something which was more advanced, much more worm-like. Okay, so we call them all the primitive worms, but when we look at phylum nematoda, now we're looking at the worms that are a bit more round. They're actually more like real worms. Uh, they're not earthworms. We're not talking about that, but what we are talking about is parasitic sort of round worms, right? So you would want to know the life cycle of trichinosis. You would want to know the life cycle of elephantiasis and just the general life cycle of Ascaris and your hookworms because it's important to know these things. It's how we protect ourselves from these critters. If you step back, most of it is oral fecal. Some of it, some of it is um, transmission by mosquitoes. So you need to take a look at these, know them, and I always say it's not a bad idea to write your own crib notes regardless of what I've done. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that is 27.2, the roundworms. Um, and I'm done. Have a good one.